Good afternoon. My name is Matt Pinnock and as Head of Department of Accounting at the University of Melbourne, I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2020 CPA Australia University of Melbourne Annual Research Lecture. We are joined at this digital event by colleagues from both industry and academia. I would like to welcome staff and students of the university, members of CPA Australia, members of the accounting profession and the general public. Of all the lecture series at the University of Melbourne, this one is the longest running. Not even COVID can stop this lecture. It was first presented by Sir Alex Fitzgerald in 1940. Sir Alex was a leader in education, a pioneer in accounting research, and was the second to serve as the role of Head of Department of Accounting at the University of Melbourne. This lecture series is indeed a proud tradition that continues today. Our presenter today, Professor Stephen Taylor, continues the long line of prominent speakers who have gone before him to tackle challenging questions, present new ideas, and find better ways of understanding the field of accounting. Therefore, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Stephen Taylor, who is a Distinguished Professor of Accounting at the University of Technology, Sydney. He's also a member of the Australian Accounting Standards Board. Stephen has made an outstanding contribution to accounting and auditing for and practice over a very long period of time. As indications of the quality of his research, he has been consistently able to publish his work in the very best journals and has been very successful in attracting research funding to support his work. Stephen's contribution can also be seen for the many leadership roles he has filled over a very long period of time. Over much of the past two decades, Stephen's work has consistently focused on issues of relevance, not only to academics, but also to the accounting and business organizations and the profession. He regularly consults downtown and is a highly sought after com commentator on current accounting and business I issues. Thus it came as no surprise when Stephen was appointed to the board of the Australian Accounting Standards Board in 2017. In light of Stephen's distinguished background and considerable contribution to accounting for and practice, we were thrilled when he agreed to deliver this year's CPA annual research lecture. He's perfectly placed to deliver this year's lecture, which, ex which explores a number of issues of direct and immediate relevance to accounting and, and business. Please enjoy Stephen Tyler's lecture, Does the Audit Market Need More Regulation? The Role of Evidence Versus in Intuition. Well, thank you for the introduction. And uh, can I just say I'm very honoured um, to have been asked to uh, deliver this year's uh, CPA Australia University of Melbourne uh, Accounting Research Lecture. Uh, obviously, uh, when this was first discussed, uh, probably nearly 12 months ago, um, I didn't imagine that I'd actually be doing this uh, from my study rather than uh, having the opportunity to interact face-to-face uh, -face, uh, with uh, an audience at the University of Melbourne. But I hope that uh, what I'm going to cover today is, uh, is informative and, uh, and also that it, uh, it can be a little bit thought-provoking. Uh, in terms of some of the issues that uh, the accounting profession and in particular auditing uh, currently face. So thank you again to CPA Australia and, uh, and the University of Melbourne for, uh, for asking me to do this. So the topic of this lecture is regulating the auditors, evidence or intuition. And what I hope to do is to really provide some, uh, some thoughts on not just why we see current calls for further regulatory intervention in the market for audit services, but to try and understand how we can evaluate uh, those calls for uh, regulatory intervention. Uh, there's no question right at the moment auditors are facing a, a variety of calls for more regulation. Uh, criticisms of audit quality uh, are common, um, but the proposed remedies appear to be very wide ranging. Uh, additional restrictions on the provision of non-audit services, uh, the terms of auditor engagements, the structure of the audit market, indeed how the accounting firms themselves should be structured. Uh, there are proposals to actually force uh, complete separation so that uh, audit firms literally would be just that. They would be uh, accounting firms that only supplied audit services. So there are some pretty drastic proposals floating around out there at the moment. So what I want to do uh, today is to first of all uh, ask what prompts these sorts of proposals 
But more importantly, what sort of evidence exists to support the call for this sort of action? And then also move to thinking about what previous legislative interventions have occurred and whether or not they appear to have been particularly successful. And uh, that leads me to then ask, why is it that so often in this sort of area, we see evidence being ignored? And one of the points you might think about uh, during the course of this lecture is, uh, can you imagine, uh, for example, um, the search for a uh, coronavirus vaccine and the way in which the success or otherwise of a particular vaccine and therefore um, the uh, basis on which it might be manufactured and then distributed. Could you imagine that that would be premised on somebody's belief that something is a superior form of treatment? Um, when we think about medical science, we know that medical sciences have what we would call an evidence-based approach. So what I want to ask today is, you know, can we have an evidence-based approach to issues that impact the accounting profession and indeed securities markets more generally? And so I want to also try and draw some lessons for, for regulators and uh, legislators as well as also some uh, points that uh, I would make in terms of things that academics can do themselves to try and aid us in having a more evidence-based approach to issues around the regulation of auditing and accounting. Well, it seems the sky is falling somewhat for uh, the audit profession. Uh, there's just a sample of some headlines that I took over the last couple of years uh, from articles that I'd uh, copied out of the Financial Times. So I just struck, stuck to one source, the Financial Times, and it was very easy to find some, uh, some pretty strong headlines. Uh, two that I enjoyed because they were published quite, uh, quite close together were uh, an article that was entitled Too Close for Comfort, The Incestuous Ties That Bind Auditors and Watchdogs, but then there was an article, a dangerous dance when auditors are too close to the client. So it seems auditors are too close to everybody. Uh, interestingly, I could not find a single headline doing a, doing a search based on, on headlines. I couldn't find anything that actually appeared to praise auditors. Uh, it's very easy to find criticisms of the auditing profession at the moment. Very hard to find anything that looks like praise. Uh, probably much the same in the Australian media, uh, maybe a little bit less strident. Uh, perhaps we've actually had less recent incidences of what look like you know, reasonably blatant audit failures. Um, but uh, one that I'll uh, come back to a little bit later in this lecture is a, an article in the Financial Review in late 2018. And the title of that was, Audit is now just a side business for the big four. So lots of headlines out there. As I said, it, if, if you sort of step back and look at what we see over the last maybe 24 months, uh, it does kind of seem like the sky is falling. Um, although I think it's probably better phrased as the sky appears to be falling again, because this looks rather like what we were seeing in the very early 2000s. So where do we get some shelter? Well, one way that uh, shelter is offered is via implementing various uh, legislative or regulatory reviews. Uh, in the UK, they've had three around the general area of auditing. Uh, the Kingman Review, which was basically a review of the Financial Reporting Council. Uh, the Competition Markets Authority study of the ser audit services market. And the Bryden Review, which was basically a holistic review of the quality and effectiveness of audit. In Australia, uh, more immediately, of course, we have the Parliamentary Joint Committee inquiry into the regulation of auditing in Australia. And they've already issued a, a first interim report and we look forward soon to seeing the final report. But across these different reviews, there have been a range of recommendations. And those recommendations have a pretty broad overall impact they, uh, in some ways, would affect the structure of the audit services market. Um, they would impact on how audit firms themselves are structured. 
Uh, they'd impact the methods of audit firm selection, as well as the duration of the audit firm's relationship with its audit client. Uh, they'd impact further on the types of services that could be provided to audit clients. Um, they would change various aspects of the auditor reporting process. And there are proposals for different sorts of disclosures uh, beyond what we currently have around the types of services that auditors provide to their clients, as well as uh, other sorts of disclosures about the audit firm and the client's relationship with them. Well, that appears to be the obvious way that uh, people want to take shelter when the, the sky seems to be falling. But um, we know that generally, uh, when we see something that's portrayed as a crisis, uh, inevitably that results in pressure for action. So it's interesting to look first of all at uh, academic evidence on uh, just how this process tends to work. And uh, a recent paper by uh, Hale, Tahoon and Wang uh, that was published in the Journal of Accounting Research is probably the most comprehensive examination undertaken to date of how corporate scandals influence regulatory intervention. Now, two important points come out of that paper. And the first one is that scandals are an antecedent to regulation. In other words, regulations tend to be reactive. The second important finding is that regulation is actually positively related to the incidence of future scandals. So one explanation for that is that when new rules are introduced, uh, the affected parties find ways around the rules, but in doing so, they actually create a greater probability of future problems. A very convincing paper, uh, very carefully executed, and as I said, basically covering 200 years uh, from a number of countries around the globe, including Australia. Now, that gets me to why we see regulatory intervention in things like, uh, in this case, uh, the accounting and audit profession. There are basically three primary theories of, of regulatory action. The first one is the public interest theory, that regulators do their very best to try and prevent bad outcomes in the future. And so when we see uh, proposals for new regulations, uh, they're essentially an attempt to avoid bad future outcomes. Then there's the legislator or regulator self-interest argument, uh, particularly popularized by George Stigler, um, among others. And that's essentially the argument that legislators and regulators respond to the pressure to do something. When there appears to be a perception of a problem, uh, it is in the regulator's self-interest to try and do something. If they're not seen to be doing something, that's actually worse from their own self-interest. And then we've got more the ideology argument, and that is that the decision to regulate or not regulate is largely driven by a, you know, a mistrust of markets or a, an extreme faith in markets. And uh, that's probably best tested by comparing um, regulatory activities at different points in time in different countries. Now, um, the self-interest argument does not, of course, rule out public interest, and I want to stress that. Um, the public interest and self-interest can quite easily become entwined. Uh, Well-motivated regulators could nevertheless be acting also in their self-interest. Another paper that I just want to highlight is one by uh, Luigi Zingales that was published in 2009. And uh, what the Zingales paper showed uh, was that regulatory responses tend to place too much weight on what we might call ex post considerations and not enough weight on existing evidence and theory. So <clears throat> essentially we, we have these theories of regulatory uh, activity that highlight for us the fact that regulators may be prone to overweighting what I'm going to call intuition and underweighting what I'm going to call evidence. Now, it's probably also true that the media plays an important role in this. Um, we know that uh, what 
we tend to observe in the reporting of issues around things like audit quality and associated financial reporting issues is that uh, typically things are presented as a crisis. And of course, that can then play into regulatory uh, and political action uh, through exactly the sort of kind of reactive self-interest argument that Stigler uh, developed. And uh, we can think of basically the, the way the media works. Um, if for the most part, there's not a lot of interest in good news. Um, I'm reminded of a, a scene in an old James Bond film where the villain, um, who's a global media proprietor, um, the producers uh, refused to say who inspired the character, but uh, the character was played by a, a British actor, Jonathan Price. And uh, if you've seen that film, The World Is Not Enough, uh, you might recall after he triggers uh, an artificial conflict in the South China Sea to help uh, launch his global news network, he turns to his closest allies and with a look of glee and uh, on his face and his eye, eyeballs bulging, says, there's no news like bad news. And I think that also portrays the way the accounting and auditing profession um, is pitched by the media. Uh, what we see is bad news, um, but we don't see any good news. And uh, that bad news uh, potentially can give the impression of some sort of crisis when it's not that obvious that that's really a representative state of things. Now, to illustrate the points that I've made so far, I'd like to focus on a simple case study. The case study is the relationship between other services and audit services that are sold to the same firm. Now, if we think back to the early 2000s, there was a pretty significant controversy because there were a number of instances of apparent audit failure where it seems that the audit fee was actually quite small compared to what the client was paying the auditor for other services. So the allegation that was made was that audit quality was low as a result of non-audit services. Now, the intuition here was, was pretty clear and that was that non-audit services have a higher profit margin than audit services. So the argument was that increasingly firms were using audit as a way of cross-selling more profitable other services to their auditor clients. So that was the intuitive argument. And if you say it quickly, it probably sounds quite intuitive. But there are at least two problems with that intuition. First of all, how frequent were the alleged audit failures? I mean, yes, we all know about Enron. Yes, we all recall WorldCom. In Europe, they recall Parmalat. In uh, Australia, we remember HIH. But you know, those anecdotes are not apparently representative of the broader population. Let me ask the question to you a different way. How many firms did not have any allegation of audit failure? 98, 99%. So the spectacular headline, the spectacular anecdote is not necessarily representative of the population at large. The second problem with that intuitive argument about the problems created by non-audit services is that it ignores all of the other incentives not to deliver a lower quality audit. In other words, it's a very partial argument. So we have to be very careful where an anecdotal piece of ev so-called evidence is offered with an intuitive interpretation, but the intuitive interpretation is really very, very partial. Now, contrast that with a more encompassing theory. Um, how can that be helpful? Well, let's take a simple theory of audit quality. And the, the, the theory I'm going to use is the, the one that's very popular in the academic literature that uh, was offered by D'Angelo around 40 years ago. And that was that essentially audit quality has two components, competence and independence. Competence is the auditor's ability to find the problem. Independence is whether or not they do something about the problem once it's been identified. Now, here's where that theory is useful. If you look at that two-step model, 
you'll recognise that essentially independence, the alleged source of problem from non-audit services, you'll recognise that independence is a second order issue. An auditor may be extremely independent, but if they're not competent enough to find the problem in the first place, then the problem will go unreported. I mean, put in a very sort of uh, harsh sense, um, you know, an independent idiot is not much help. Um, that idiot who can't see a problem, uh, even though they would always do something about it if they found it, um, their failure to find the problem is really the, the issue. So simple audit uh, quality theory helps us understand that perhaps auditor independence is not such a big issue. And contrast that too with other theories about uh, the role of non-audit services themselves. Uh, the knowledge transfer argument, for example, um, is one that suggests that uh, audit quality may increase with the amount of non-audit services because it can increase competence. So independence may be reduced, but competence may be increased. That's where having the overarching theory to begin with helps in actually framing the issue in a more sensible manner. What it also highlights though, is the need for uh, an accurate description of what is really going on, as well as the need ultimately for rigorous causal evidence. Can we identify ways in which there is systematic evidence of, in this case, non-audit services causing lower audit quality? So, Carrying on, uh, what sort of evidence has been produced? Well, at the time this was a major issue in the very early 2000s, there was a paper published uh, using uh, the earliest available audit and non-audit fee data reported by US firms from 2000 onwards. Uh, the paper was uh, by uh, Frankel, Johnson and Nelson. Um, and it was published in the accounting review and it was published relatively quickly compared to what we're accustomed to. Um, it was a special issue of the accounting review. This paper actually got a lot of attention. In fact, the, the authors sort of media celebrities for a little bit um, that was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal uh, where the Wall Street Journal pointed out academics find evidence to support limiting non-audit services. What the paper actually did was find two key results. One was to show that the absolute variation in a measure of earnings manipulation uh, seemed like it increased with non-audit services. And also the probability of client firms um, just beating analyst forecasts increased as well. Now, that paper relied on how you measure the significance of non-audit services. And it also relied on proxies for a reduction in audit quality. And the proxies that it used were, as I said, a, a popular measure of earnings manipulation based on accruals and evidence of so-called benchmark beating. Now, perhaps not surprisingly, a lot of academics came along after that and looked very carefully at how the Frankel et al paper had been executed and what measures it had relied on, both for the uh, non-audit services construct itself, as well as the potential effect. Now, I've highlighted six papers on this slide. These six papers were all published in the short number of ensuing years after the Frankel et al paper. Um, they were all published in what I would unambiguously be, re be regarded as the top five accounting journals. And in each case, the papers push back against the conclusions that Frankel, uh, Johnson and Nelson reached. So some of the papers looked at alternative ways of capturing the effect of non-audit services. The Defond et al paper looked at audit qualification frequency. Uh, the Kinney et al paper looked at the likelihood of restated accounting results. Um, the Ruddock et al paper looked at a measure of conservatism, which noticeably is a directional measure 
and that was premised on the argument that uh, the real criticism um, by regulators and the, the business press was that uh, non-audit services resulted in more aggressive accounting, not just more variable accounting, but more aggressive accounting. The Larker and Richardson paper was a very careful um, re-examination of the original evidence and they showed that uh, the evidence that Frankel et al. reported is actually heavily concentrated in firms that are less economically significant, as well as in firms with weak corporate governance. Now, two other papers that are worth mentioning, the Ashbau et al. paper and the Chung and Caliper paper, they were both motivated by concerns with how the Frankel et al. paper represented the significance of non-audit services. So they looked at alternative ways of capturing how important those services were relative to audit. And in particular, uh, the extent to which <clears throat> a firm typically purchases a given amount of those services and or how important the, they were in the audit firm's entire client portfolio. So the point I'm getting at here is a normal academic process that ensued after the Frank Ledow paper probably can be taken as suggesting that the Frankel et al. paper was somewhat um, premature in concluding that there was rigorous evidence to support restricting non-audit services. So what are the lessons from that round, what I'll call round one? Well, be careful of anecdotes. Are they really representative? Intuition can, uh, can be useful sometimes, but it can also be very dangerous. You need to contrast the intuitive argument against good descriptive, good theoretical and good empirical evidence. In that case, as I point out, theory suggests that independence, which was the alleged source of the problem, independence is actually just a second order effect. Um, descriptive evidence showed that audit failures were, were very infrequent anyway. Might have been spectacular when they did occur, but they didn't occur very often. Uh, causal empirical evidence, particularly the papers that followed Frank et al, causal empirical evidence helped us get a better understanding of the fact that, uh, if anything, it's difficult to, to conclude that uh, non-audit services really did cause um, lower audit quality and hence lower quality of financial reporting. But of course, another problem there is that that causal research typically takes time, it needs data, um, and so you sometimes can't get the results as quickly as, uh, as the uh, financial media and regulators and politicians would like. One final point I'll just make there too is that uh, it's interesting that those papers that followed Frankel et al are essentially all papers that for the most part, their main result is that they do not reject the null hypothesis. In other words, that they're important papers because they don't find anything. And that's pretty rare in the, uh, in the research literature in accounting and finance. Uh, it's unusual to find papers published that don't reject the null hypothesis. And that's possibly a problem for the, the, the research literature itself, that uh, sometimes perhaps we're, uh, we're a little too keen to try and find evidence that rejects the null hypothesis when it could be quite important if we can show clearly and satisfactorily that uh, in fact the null hypothesis actually holds. There really isn't a causal relationship. And of course, I again draw the contrast with medical research. Uh, in medical research, failing to reject the null is, a, is an absolutely critical result. Well, let's go to round two of this controversy, because again, we see criticisms of, the, of these other services in the, in the business press. Again, we see regulators and politicians expressing concern. Well, the popular claim continues. All of this non-audit services stuff causes lower audit quality and hence poor quality accounting. But wait a minute. Isn't that now heavily restricted? Well, it certainly is heavily restricted in the US. 
possibly less so in other parts of the world, but certainly uh, we have uh, various independence and ethical rules now and statements that have to be made, um, which are intended to address this problem. Um, yet at the same time, it seems as though audit uh, services have become less important, particularly at the big accounting firms. So the data you see on the screen I took from uh, this financial review article in late 2018. What it shows is the percentage of total revenue at each of the Australian arms of the big four, um, as they report it, uh, that comes from audit. And there's a pretty clear pattern there, isn't there? Uh, for each of the big four, you can see that audit has declined as a percentage of their total revenue. So other services are replacing audit at these firms in terms of their overall significance. Now, that is portrayed by the media as a problem. But hang on a minute, remember again, the rules that have been in place for some time. And let's step back and ask the question, well, is this actually um, directly a reflection of the same problem that was previously identified? And the answer turns out to be no, it can't be. Because the growth in these other services is not coming from audit clients. Now, a report that was published um, by the uh, Australian Audit and Assurance Standards Board, a research report number four, um, is a very good example of useful descriptive research because it actually shows us what's really going on in the market as a whole. Doesn't tell us why, doesn't tell us whether it's good or bad, but it helps us understand what the typical situation really is. And if you look at, uh, at that descriptive evidence, and I've summarized here the results for the big four audit firms and the firms that constitute the next tier of the market, you can see here that um, the amount of non-audit services relative to the audit fee has been pretty invariant, pretty constant over that uh, five year period that's summarized there. Um, for the big four, it's somewhere around uh, non-audit services on average are about a third of audit fees, well below the guidelines, for example, in Europe, which is 70% as, a, as an alleged maximum amount. Um, and for the, the, the next tier of audit firms, it's, a, it's more like a quarter. So that hasn't changed very much. So if these firms are now earning less of their overall revenue from audit firms, from, from um, auditing, then clearly that doesn't come from selling more services to their audit clients. It comes from expanding the scope of what they sell to firms who are not their audit clients. So this is a good example of where descriptive research can help us understand what is really going on. Why is that important? Well, let's go back to the claim. Oh, there's a problem because uh, audit fees are a smaller proportion of audit firms total revenue. Why would it be a problem? Well, it can't be a problem if, uh, if it's not because they're selling more uh, non-audit services to their audit clients, it can't be an independence issue. So how could it be an issue? Well, it must be an issue apparently using our, our audit quality model. It must therefore have some sort of competence effect. But what would that competence effect be? Um, essentially what this is highlighting is that um, those uh, who jump up and down about uh, the declining percentage of total revenue coming from audit, um, they must actually be arguing that big accounting firms just don't care as much about audit quality, that they're somehow um, less concerned and therefore less competent. Now, does that argument make a lot of sense? Well, here are some obvious pushbacks. And what about all of the other considerations, such as the increase in audit standards, um, the increase in litigation uh, and so on that, uh, that has occurred? Um, this, uh, these are all things that would work against the sort of effect that, that must be assumed. 
And, you know, let me ask the question the following way. I mean, how, it, how would providing uh, more non-audit services to other firms make you less competent at delivering an audit to an audit client? When you say it like that, I don't think the linkage is anywhere near as clear as the simple intuitive statement would suggest, oh, there's a problem with audit quality because the big audit firms now get more revenue than they used to from non-audit services. So the point I'm trying to illustrate here is that a simple intuitive statement can be quite misleading. It can be misleading in terms of what it says about the actual underlying situation. And it can also be misleading in terms of making a very partial and possibly even illogical uh, connection as to how a causal effect would really exist. So the non-audit services case study really highlights this, this problem. Uh, and that is too much uh, reliance on intuition, not enough reliance on evidence. Now, there are broader applications. Um, I've focused on the non-audit services debate as a case study, but think about some of the other uh, arguments and claims that we currently observe. Um, some say that there's not enough competition in the market for audit services. Well, um, what, is, what is a competitive market? What, what is the optimal number of participants in terms of suppliers? Uh, is a concentrated market always less competitive than an atomistic one? Uh, what is competition on, uh, based on? Is it based on quality or is it based on price? Um, how do search costs and hence possible competition vary according to the number of suppliers? These are important questions, but the simple statement auditing is not competitive, uh, it might at a superficial level be intuitively appealing, but there's a lot more theory and evidence needed before you would arrive at that conclusion. Uh, what about alleged price cutting, uh, the, the old low balling problem as it's often described? Uh, interestingly, we still see that allegation occurring that, uh, that uh, price cutting, fee cutting on initial engagements uh, results in, uh, in lower audit quality because auditors need to ensure they recover those, those, those losses somewhere further down the track. Okay, so if you believe that that's true, how would you reconcile it with the claim that there's not enough competition? Yet, interestingly, in some of these recent reports, uh, particularly in the UK, you see both allegations. Yet, it, it's very hard to imagine how you can reconcile the two of them. In fact, there's some uh, very good uh, recent paper uh, by Barua et al. Um, in the Journal of Accounting and Economics that goes back and revisits earlier evidence on so-called uh, fee, initial fee cutting and actually provides some very, very convincing evidence that, that fee cutting is largely a myth. Um, there's really not much rigorous evidence of so-called fee cutting. What about the effects of audit firm tenure? Some parts of the world now, there are limits, not just on partner tenure, but on audit firm tenure. Or at a minimum, there are actual or proposed requirements for mandatory tendering. Uh, what does the evidence on rotation show us? Um, how does it increase rather than result in a decrease in audit quality? Um, when we look at the evidence around partner rotation, I would suggest it doesn't look particularly promising. So why would we then carry through to having a mandatory audit firm rotation? Another area where there's a proposal at the, where some are proposing drastic changes is around the whole process by which an auditor is appointed. Uh, there are even calls, uh, particularly in the UK, for a government agency to be created that would assign an auditor to a particular firm. Now, what sort of unintended consequences might arise from that? Uh, particularly theory can help us with that. 
Uh, is there any evidence from regulated markets indeed from other sorts of services or products that are regulated in this way that could inform what effect this might have on audit quality. So the evidence-based approach is not just something that I can argue is clearly relevant to considering a debate around the merits or otherwise of providing non-audit services, it also is an approach that really needs to underlie debate about all aspects of audit quality. Now, have I really been arguing that, uh, that regulation, regulatory intervention to address audit quality is ill-advised? Well, absolutely not. That's not what I've been arguing at all. What I have been arguing um, is that we need uh, evidence on which to base regulation. We also need evidence to consider the effects of regulation. And I'll just very briefly mention in the interests of time, the fact that there have been a number of studies done in recent years that look at the effects of the creation and operation of the PCAOB in the US. And those papers, which have been, again, have been published in, in, in the world's leading accounting and finance journals, generally provide strong support for the PCAOB having had a positive effect on audit quality and also a positive effect on perceptions of audit quality as well. So there is also an important role for research uh, in demonstrating what effect uh, regulatory innovation actually has. And as a case study here, the PCAOB um, has certainly been shown to have had a number of positive effects. So a recap on where we're at. I've tried to highlight the dangers in, uh, in relying too much on intuition and anecdotes, uh, and therefore argued that what we need to rely on is evidence. We need an evidence-based approach to regulation, just as the scientific, scientific and medical communities wouldn't think of having anything other than an evidence-based approach to, uh, to medical and, uh, and science policy. So, Again, three types of evidence, descriptive evidence. That's important because it goes beyond an anecdote. It shows us what is happening on average. It might not tell us why it's happening, but it at least provides us with a basic benchmark or bent or baseline of what sort of frequency we observe a particular type of, of outcome or trend. Um, and surveys can be very important here. Again, I'll just highlight another uh, research report by uh, the Australian Audit and Assurance Standards Board, and that is a, a survey of investor perceptions, which again is very informative about people's concerns with audit quality. Theory is important. Theory can actually frame the problem in a way that often highlights limitations in simplistic intuitive statements. And empirical evidence is very, very important because ultimately that can really help us understand the extent to which causal links appear to actually be in place. Why do things look like they do? And then subsequently, what are the effective changes? It's not always easy to conduct uh, studies that convincingly demonstrate the effect of regulatory change, but they're obviously very important when we find ourselves further down the track, debating even more regulatory intervention to address the same issue. So what are the lessons for regulators and legislators? Well, the key point I wanted to flag is the danger of overweighting anecdotes and recent experiences. Um, it's important to see the, uh, the need for an evidentiary basis for developing new regulations and evaluating past ones. This means that regulators and legislators need to work with the research community. And they can do that if they're as transparent as they can possibly be, if they can help facilitate public and competitive analysis of data, be prepared to debate the implications and findings. And I have to say that from my perspective, the US has been much better at this than uh, countries like Australia. Um, the Economic Analysis Division at the SEC 
as well as the uh, unit within the PCAOB that is very much focused on bringing economic theory and rigorous empirical evidence into play in debating and deciding optimal regulatory intervention. Uh, I will also point out um, that both the Australian Accounting Standards Board and the Australian Audit and Assurance Standards Board do have a framework which specifically recognises the role of research, and that is to have research informed standard setting. But in terms of the area we're focusing on today, uh, in terms of audit quality, is issues about audit quality and regulation of auditing, uh, I think for the most part, um, we have not seen evidence of a strong collaborative relationship between regulators and researchers. Lessons for academics. Well, the first point I'd make is if we want our research to be relevant, if we want our research to have an impact, pay attention to the debate. Let the debates that we observe be the source of our research projects. Uh, rather than just throwing data together and trying to look for a significant uh, coefficient value, look for evidence that actually directly addresses a, a, re a debate. Um, and that really, as I said, fits the, the general pressure that we face for producing research that has genuine relevance or genuine impact. It also means we need to think carefully about how we proxy um, the alleged causes of audit quality decline, as well as the way in which we actually try to proxy um, the things that are alleged to cause declines in audit quality. So both the dependent and independent variable. If you think back to my NAS case study, you can see how careful thought around both the dependent variable and the appropriate independent variable had a significant influence on what the findings were. So that's another way in which academics can contribute. Of course, we also as a community need to recognize that uh, our, our somewhat obsessive approach to trying to find statistically significant results perhaps means that uh, at times we may be underweighting the importance of showing that associations don't appear to exist. Uh, and most importantly for academics, recognise that the rigour that we bring to whatever we do, whether it's a, a survey, whether it's a questionnaire, whether it's development of theory or whether it's construction of a rigorous archival empirical paper, that the rigour we bring to our work is really one of the key things that we can contribute. So we want to avoid trying to make quick conclusions or, uh, or in effect, jumping on board some sort of anecdotal bandwagon. So my conclusions. Well, if you think about the way medical research takes place, there are four basic steps. Identify whether a problem really exists. Carefully investigate the cause of the problem. Then based on evidence of the cause, identify an appropriate treatment and then continue subjecting that treatment to rigorous ongoing evaluation. Now, I would argue that when we look at previous and current debates about audit quality crises that are alleged, they probably don't have those steps. Uh, as a result, there's probably too much reliance on intuition and anecdote as the basis for reaching conclusions. Yet, when you step back and think about that medical analogy, the role of evidence should be very, very clear at each of the four stages. So my overall message that uh, in considering some of the possibly legitimate concerns around the structure of the market for audit services and audit quality, we need appropriate evidence. But when we do have that evidence, we also need to pay attention to the findings whether they are supportive or whether they are in contradiction of the rationale for future regulation. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you again to CPA Australia and the University of Melbourne. And I look forward to your questions. The first question is the role of ASIC in this. Should ASIC play a greater role in policing the qualifications of an auditor? 
Uh, I'm not sure what the answer to that really is, because in terms of auditor qualifications, uh, if we're talking about the listed public company sector, I mean, there are pretty clear qualifications that auditors have to have, including registration. So I'm not, I'm not really sure that there's a, much of a debate there about the role of regulations per se. Uh, I don't think, I, I'm, I've never seen any allegation that somebody who's not qualified to be an auditor has been uh, leading an audit on, a, on some si a public company or even significant private company. So I'm, I'm not sort of sure that that would be really a major issue. Okay, any other, qu any other questions from the audience? And while we're waiting for questions, uh, Steve, would you consider a role at ASIC? I think you'd be good. <laughs> <laughs> you said what they should be doing. So would you be prepared to do that? Yourself? Look, I think, I think ASIC um, has an important audit inspection role. And maybe that was what the question had intended to, to address. Uh, one of the difficulties in interpreting the output from the ASIC inspection process is that uh, ASIC are legitimately at pains to point out that their inspection process is risk-based. Now, that means that when they say there are perhaps 25% of audits appear to have some deficiency, and I think that was sort of the headline figure last time, that leads people to think that in a quarter of all cases, the audit can't be relied upon. Now, that's clearly not the case because demonstrable instances of actual audit failure are extremely small. So while there may be a problem in some aspect of the audit, and if we had all the details, we may conclude that in fact there really is a problem, but we don't know that because we can't see the detail. Uh, it, it's difficult to interpret those sort of numbers because we don't know the cause and effect. We don't know whether or not the sort of deficiencies that are being identified would in fact lead to or be likely to lead to actual instances of audit failure. So the numbers themselves don't mean very much in the absence of, first of all, a clear understanding of what the link is between the alleged deficiency and the likelihood of audit failure. And two, transparently being aware of who these companies are. And one of the things the PCAOB has done very well in the US is work with teams of researchers to facilitate using the data from their inspection process to get a better understanding about what the relationship is between various forms of identified deficiencies and the likelihood that there are significant problems with the quality of financial reporting. And we, we, we're not able to, to do that. It's a, it's a much more uh, opaque uh, process and obviously a much more opaque reporting process that ASIC adopts. Okay, thanks Steve. Uh, there's a bunch of questions here coming through so I think a lot of them we may have to defer and you perhaps you can answer and we can post it up on a uh, web page after the event. Uh, so I'll pick some at random. Um, so a question here from Adrian Black. Uh, what are your thoughts on rushing the Order Committee interim rec recommendations through to due to COVID-19 rather than con con continuing with the, with the hearings? So should we... So obviously we, referring to the PJC... Uh, so should we push for in audit regulation? I don't... I mean, I think, I think most of what's been recommended so far by the PJC is relatively harmless. Uh, I don't think the PJC has really identified... Uh, really substantial causes for concern. Uh, some of the testimony that, that I reviewed uh, seemed to be do a pretty good job of painting some colourful stories, but colourful stories, as I tried to allude to in my lecture, aren't necessarily very good evidence of a problem, let alone what causes the problem. And I think to their credit, the, the PJC has taken a relatively a sensible uh, informed approach in trying to gather as much evidence as they can and making some recommendations around disclosure and certain aspects of the, the, the delivery of audit and other services that I don't think are particularly damaging to the audit profession. Uh, likewise, I guess, I, I don't think they're going to have any dramatic effect on the capital market either. Okay, uh, another question. It's a, difficult, it's a good one, this one, actually. I like this. This is from Jane Horsky. 
competition is very important, but how can you compete, can compete on quality if we can't ob ob observe quality? I think that to me is a hard problem here. So what's, what's, what's your views on that? Well, at some point you have to recognize that uh, you've got to learn some, some goods or services you have to actually have experience of. So in economics, we have the, con the, the concept of experienced goods. There's also the concept of what's sometimes talk talked about as credence goods. And essentially what this means is that it's very difficult to identify the quality of something until you've actually used it or had some experience with it. And so I think it's reasonable to say that there is competition on quality and there is competition on price. And probably the audit market reflects both of those things. Uh, what I really tried to focus on in my lecture was the, the fact that there are a number of critics of the uh, audit profession that argue that it's not competitive. There's only four big firms who dominate. And in fact, really in Australia, it's three big firms dominate the ASX 200. Uh, Deloitte's um, list of audit clients is much, much smaller in that segment of the Australian market. But the question is, how many large audit firms do you need to have competition? Uh, you can have an auction for your house. And if you've got two people who want to buy it, you can watch competition. It's uh, House auctions are the greatest example of, a, of a, a, a bare economic market at work. You can stand there and watch two people bid for the same thing. Uh, so it's not clear exactly how many big firms you need in servicing large listed firms to say the market is competitive. The irony is though, that sometimes it's the same people who argue that the market is not competitive enough, who then turn around and make the allegation that audit firms are overly competitive in cutting their fees on initial engagements. And you, know, you can't have things both ways. You can't say the world is flat and the world is round. Uh, both answers can't be correct. So I think what I'm trying to do is point out again with the competition angle, that there are these anecdotes out there that people will use one way or the other. But ironically, you've got the same group of people sometimes saying directly opposite things. Okay, so good answer. Uh, we've got five, we've got, there's a whole bunch of questions actually, and I think we'll send them to you and you can do an email response on an individual basis. Looks like I'll be writing an essay after this. If you're open to that, but I will close with two. Uh, the first one's from Jane McKay from PwC, I think actually. Uh, so she's asked uh, very fairly, if you were to pick the most important research question in an immediate sense, uh, what would that be? I know it's a tough question, but uh, anyway, it's an interesting one. <laughs> and what's the biggest issue here uh, that we need evidence on, basically? I think one of the really interesting areas is the extent to which length of service is associated with higher or lower quality auditing and financial reporting. I think this is an area where we already have some research as a result of mandatory partner rotation rules. I think uh, if people are able to identify settings where there has been some form of mandatory rotation, uh, then I think that can inform debate in some parts of the world where they haven't imposed mandatory rotation but they in fact are talking about doing it. Another area that I think is fascinating is when we start to see in some regimes, this mandatory requirement to at least put the audit out to tender. How do the results in terms of the pricing of audit and the quality of what follows, how do they compare with circumstances that have previously existed where that process is entirely voluntary? That is, you only put your audit out to tender when you think it's a good idea, not because a regulation says you have to do it at that point. Okay, so great answer. And I'll close with one last question, but there's a whole bunch of questions. So I'll, if you don't mind, uh, they'll email you. Sure. <laughs> I'd be happy with that. But uh, this is a, a, uh, a anonymous question, as it turns out. Uh, but it's actually an interesting one. I've got a lot of uh, sympathy for this one. ASIC have not released the formulas supporting their order quality assertions, which is why people query their conclusions on order quality. And I think it's a very fundamental point. Should ASIC be more transparent and allow an analysis of their calculations and determinations of order quality? So I'll leave it at that with you. It's the last question. 
Short answer, absolutely. I don't understand the, the really the, the way in which uh, identification of, of genuine audit shortcomings should be kept secret from the people who presumably would be the potential victims of those shortcomings. And if ASIC reviews the audit of a firm in which I'm an investor and they believe there is a significant deficiency in the audit, as an investor, I'd like to know that. As a researcher, I'd like to be able to identify whether there's any discernible evidence on average of there being lower quality financial reporting associated with these instances where material deficiencies are identified. But it's, it's not a transparent process externally. And again, you know, I think there are a lot of great people working at ASIC, but uh, I think historically, uh, we haven't had the same degree of transparency around uh, ASIC's investigations and analysis across capital market issues broadly. I can remember many years ago uh, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, Australia was effectively the last major stock exchange in the world to have a ban on short selling. And at an ASIC summer school, I got up and I asked the then chairman of ASIC, how do you justify this when everybody else has taken away this sort of restriction? And his comment was very simply, we have research that supports our decision. And I said, well, that's interesting. All the papers in the major finance journals come to the opposite conclusion. Would I be able to see your research so I could understand how you arrive at a different conclusion from a lot of very prominent financial economists? And the answer, no. Okay. Now, I don't know if things have improved a lot in the ensuing decade or so, but uh, you know, I think there's the opportunity for us to do much better in that regard. Okay, so great comments. So thanks everybody for their their um, their uh, co comments and post through any any further uh, questions. And I'm sure Steve will be happy. I'm to try and address them all one after the other. And we'll uh, give Steve some homework, and I'm sure we'll be happy to address a summary of some of the questions, and we'll post them up on the web page. The answers because it is clearly a very important, very important topic that that our Steve has raised. So we'll close with that, and now I'll introduce the uh, Victorian President of CPA Australia, who will close the proceedings. Thank you, Professor Pinnock. On behalf of CPA Australia and the University of Melbourne, I would like to thank Professor Taylor for his presentation and everyone who has joined us for this first virtual annual accounting research lecture. The CPA Global Community exceeds 165,000 members across 150 countries and CPA Australia is committed to supporting its members through education, training, technical support, advocacy and thought leadership events. CPA Australia works with employers, members and other professional bodies to influence and represent their views, the government, regulators, industry, academics and the community. CPA Australia is proud to partner with the University in bringing this lecture to you and this partnership is founded on the belief that education is key to developing future leaders and the continued advancement of the accounting profession. Today's 81st research lecture remains the oldest continuous lecture series in the world. Since 1940, this lecture has provoked thought leadership and research across accounting and finance. And today's presentation by Professor Taylor on regulation of auditors has continued this tradition. As we've heard today, auditors face ongoing pressure for greater regulation of non-audit services whilst delivering co-audit functions and remaining independent. No doubt you'll agree that this is a challenging dilemma that is not going to be solved today. I'd like to conclude by saying my three takeouts from today are be careful of decision making by anecdotes, an evidence-informed debate, and based on that evidence, determine an appropriate course of action. Now that you'll agree that these are very wise words from Professor Taylor. Thank you and have a great day.